Um, the first um, speaker will be Dr. Plotkin, who um, is a professor of neurology and executive director of um, the Stephen and Catherine Papa Center of Neuro-Oncology at Massachusetts General Hospital and um, chief of the Division of Neuro-Oncology there. Uh, Dr. Plotkin, some of you might know very well, is an integral part of the NF community and has become an international leader in neurofibromatosis. He is um, a well-funded researcher, a skilled clinician, and an educator today in the role for our patients. His talk today will be about a new clinical criteria for NF2, and we're all very excited to, to hear about that. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and good morning to everybody, maybe good evening in some parts of the world. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm gonna to be sharing my slides in a moment. Thank you, of course, to the Children's Tumor Foundation for uh, hosting the NF Forum year after year. It's such an important part of, uh, of the year. Just wanna make sure that I have these in the right Orientation. How does that look to everybody? Is that okay? Wonderful. So again, I'm gonna take us through the revision of the diagnostic criteria for neurofibromatosis uh, because we hope these uh, changes will be in effect later this year. And one of the first questions that anyone asks is why are we doing this? And I wanna give you a little bit of history and explanation for that process. So first of all, the diagnostic criteria that we currently use were established almost, uh, what is this, 35 years ago at an NIH consensus conference. And you can see we've had really no updates uh, since that time, no significant ones. And when you put this in perspective, the current criteria we're using uh, were established before we even knew the genes that cause NF1 and NF2 and schwannomatosis, before we could do genetic testing, before we realized that schwannomatosis was distinct from NF2, before we had all this new clinical information about these conditions, and before we recognized the presence of an NF1 type condition called Legius syndrome. So a lot has happened since 1987 and we're a little bit behind the times. But when I, what I wanna emphasize is the reason that we're doing this is to improve patient care. This is not an, an academic exercise for doctors, nurses, and other people just to, just to do for the sake of doing it. This is something that I feel personally will impact my ability to give patient care. So I wanna demonstrate that by showing you this image on the left, uh, which is a, a, an individual who has bilateral vestibular schwannomas. And I think you can see my arrow right here. This is an image that was put in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is our flagship publication. And they have challenges each month where doctors, nurses, investigators, so forth, they, they'll, they'll take a quiz. So they present this individual's history and the image you see here. And there is no single image that's more classic for NF2. And what you see in the responses below is that uh, this condition called MEN type 1, 7% of people thought it was that, 13% thought it was a condition called von Hippel-Lindau, and then 10% Lee Fraumeni. And what's 50% of people got it right. So I, I would argue that's super low, but, but that is the most common response. What I want to show you is that 20% of people, which is twice the rate of the other conditions, thought that this was NF1. And it shows you that doctors and nurses who read the New England Journal of Medicine, our best journal, are likely to confuse NF type one and NF type two. And that is completely unacceptable when it comes to patient care. So the revision of these diagnostic criteria wants to address this key problem that patients with NF2 and schwannomatosis uh, can be misdiagnosed. So how did we go about this process? This is the culmination of about five, almost four years of work. It began with the steering committee and a global panel of 76 experts. We met and developed recommendations for changes in New York City. Uh, and then we sent out these recommendations in a process known as a Delphi process where you can get feedback from experts around the world on those recommendations. 
You then take those responses and round two, you then rec you, you revise your uh, recommendations. We then did another Delphi round and this led to us presenting these um, new criteria at the international NF meeting in Paris, France. We then went to a round three where we involved non-NF experts. So let's say an expert in genetics who's not an NF physician or an NF nurse uh, who then gave their recommendations. And finally, we presented these recommendations to many, many patients and family members to try to see whether they made sense. Ultimately, this whole process fed back to the proposals that I'm going to show you today. These are what we call our consensus recommendations. And to give you an idea and to acknowledge the uh, people who were involved on the clinician side for this, I just wanna show you more than hundred people from across the world, from across different specialties have been involved in this process. And without them, we couldn't have got uh, completed this work. Now, I wanna begin talking about NF1, which I was told not to do, but I think I wanna make the case to you that the reason we're doing this is to differentiate NF1 from NF2 and schwannomatosis. And so we have to begin at least understanding how this relates to all three groups. So I wanna dive into the most important change in all of these criteria, and that is how to use genetic testing. So the first thing I wanna tell you is you may have heard from your physicians like me or other people about genetic mutations. And I just wanna point out Medicine evolves and language evolves. We no longer call these changes mutations. Uh, it has a very negative connotation. And it turns out for a variety of reasons, the word mutation does not make sense scientifically either. For that reason, you're gonna hear me talk about something called a pathogenic variant in a gene. The word pathogenic means disease causing or condition causing and a variant means just a change from the typical DNA sequence or gene sequence. So throughout this talk, you'll hear me talk about pathogenic variants. In your brain, you should think, okay, that's what we used to call a mutation. Now, genetic analysis is used in many clinical practices, particularly in Europe, uh, but has not uh, been taken up entirely by the US and some other places. So there is variation in this. However, 95% of our experts uh, supported the use of adding genetic analysis to this criteria for a variety of reasons. Uh, it can lead to earlier diagnosis, give better diagnosis. And we also know that genetic analysis when performed in the correct uh, scenario uh, can be highly sensitive for identifying these pathogenic variants I, discuss I discussed. Now, we also recognize that while genetic testing is incredibly helpful in many circumstances, it's also not universally uh, uh, available. And for that reason, Genetic analysis is not required for diagnosis of many conditions, uh, but can be used and is preferable in many. And the final thing I wanna point out, and this is gonna be an issue moving forward, is that genetic analysis alone is not enough. And why do we say that? Let's say you're a person who unfortunately has a diagnosis of breast cancer, and then they do a gene test on that tumor, they might identify a pathogenic variant in the NF1 or NF2 gene. And that might lead somebody to believe that they have this, these genetic conditions when in fact they don't, it could be a random variant that has no meaning. And so I just wanna emphasize genetic testing is going to be integrated into our workflow, um, but is not likely, it will not be sufficient on its own to lead to a diagnosis. I'm gonna show you three slides on NF1 to give you an idea of what we're doing. You can see here, uh, we've added the requirement for bilateral freckles in the arms. I'm not gonna go through the details since we're not gonna focus on NF1. We added a new criterion in the eye where you can find these little dots in the back part of the eye called the choroid. And then finally, we clarified some of these changes having to do with bony abnormalities or skeletal abnormalities. Again, I don't wanna uh, spend too much time. I will say to point out that these NF1 revised criteria have now been published in the medical literature and CTF, which has been a partner from the very beginning, uh, has uh, simultaneously 
uh, put forth information for patients and families to complement that and has a strong outreach program to clinicians. This is from the webpage on CTF. You can go look at it. It will eventually be followed by web pages for NF2 and schwannomatosis when those criteria are published. And I'll just point out the schematic goes through the different requirements uh, for a diagnosis for an individual or a family with uh, NF1. So let's move to the topic of the day and, and talk about NF2 and schwannomatosis. So what are the challenges within this area? And I think the key one I wanna to convey to you today is that while we have uh, long known about NF2 and for about 20 or 30 years about schwannomatosis, it turns out, and many of you probably know, that there is overlap between these two conditions. That is, somebody with NF2 or schwannomatosis can have the same features as each other. That is, the presence of schwannomas and occasionally meningiomas. And when you look at the, when the Gareth Evans and his team in the United Kingdom looked at their uh, database of families and individuals, they found out that 9% of people that they were diagnosing with schwannomatosis, when they got sophisticated genetic testing, found out that instead of schwannomatosis, they actually had NF2. And conversely, when they looked at individuals who had a diagnosis of NF2, they actually had schwannomatosis upon genetic analysis. And that means that our clinical diagnosis, which is very good, is not perfect, and probably about 10% of people are misdiagnosed. We also know that if you're an older individual diagnosed with NF2, based on the presence of bilateral vestibular schwannomas, that actually may represent not NF2, but a random and very, very unlikely possibility of having two independent tumors that are not caused by NF2. And that's probably, if you're over 50, probably equally likely to having NF2. Other reasons that these criteria, the, the old criteria don't work is we now know high-grade glioma does not occur in NF2, nor do neurofibromas. And that raises the key issue with the name of neurofibromatosis type two. If you don't have neurofibromas in neurofibromatosis type two, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So how about the schwannomatosis criteria? I already mentioned that some of these individuals actually have NF2. Um, and that one of the key things is we now know that there are more than, that there is more than one genetic variant that can cause schwannomatosis, meaning more than just the SMARC B1 gene. There's also, we now know about the LZTR1 gene and many investigators are looking for additional genes so we need a, a system that can accommodate multiple genes and new genes into the, the naming system. So as I mentioned, uh, we have thought about renaming uh, these um, two conditions to, to reflect the data I just presented to you. So what would be the advantage of renaming NF2 and schwannomatosis under a new name? Well, number one is we're going to get this out of the neurofibromatosis uh, name. Uh, because uh, that creates a lot of confusion, as I showed you in the first slide. We think that it's going to allow us to facilitate clinical care guidelines more appropriately. I already mentioned that neurofibromas don't occur in NF2. We also recognize that these names should reflect that overlap in NF2 and schwannomatosis, where people share many of the same symptoms. Changing the name would allow us to emphasize the genetic diagnosis and leave room for discovery of additional genes. And uh, we think that moving these into the correct categories will be appropriate. Now, the last point I want to make here, and, and only a few of us have been around long enough in this field to remember it, we've changed these names before, and I sh it, it should have been 1987 in this slide, not 1997. Prior to NF1 having its current name, it was called von Recklinghausen's disease or peripheral neurofibromatosis. And we successfully changed that name to NF1 based on a lot of the work of Vic Riccardi, who is one of our senior and most respected physicians. Likewise, prior to being named NF2, it was called central neurofibromatosis. And, and so names can change. We can do it. So what are the disadvantages? Obviously, it is very challenging for everyone who lives with the condition of NF2 to think about changing that name. It's difficult for organizations with NF in their names. 
We always worry that this can impact our funding efforts. We worry that it makes things more and more rare, which can be challenging for a variety of reasons. And some would argue, listen, why are you doing this? We have so much more important things to do. So these are some of the reasons why we thought not to do it. But ultimately what we're proposing after this four year procedure is that we lump both NF2 and schwannomatosis under the name schwannomatosis. And I'm gonna tell you more about this. And the reason is we believe that these conditions are united by the genetic predisposition for schwannoma formation. To further that, we're also gonna rec recommend genetic or molecular analysis. And the way we're doing that, we're saying that it is clinically indicated for anyone suspected of having schwannomatosis except for individuals who present with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, because that's never been reported in, in that's only been reported in NF2 before. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that. Um, so here is how we would think about this broader classification scheme for schwannomatosis. And this is um, built on where genetics is going now. So for example, we're not the only group, uh, uh, we're not the only uh, uh, disease group where we're struggling with the naming. And in fact, as genetics becomes more integrated into medicine, there is now a movement within the field to say that you have a gene, when you identify a gene variant, and then you put the word related, and then you put the clinical syndrome behind it. So for us, um, this would be NF2 related schwannomatosis. That means it's related to the NF2 gene. Uh, and that's what we previously called NF2. We would also have SMART1 related schwannomatosis, LZ1 related schwannomatosis. And in some cases, you could get schwannomatosis without identified mutation in blood. So that is that you can't identify it or otherwise specify. Whoops. So I'm gonna go through these now, explain them in a little bit more detail. So uh, when the, um, for what we formerly called NF2, uh, we will now basically use much of the same uh, data as before. We look at how many vestibular schwannomas on MRI scan, do we see meningiomas or ependymomas? And then in addition, we allow for uh, the use of these genetic testing results. Uh, and that can help us identify individuals who either have a clinical diagnosis, that is bilateral vestibular schwannomas, or they can have features of schwannomas meningiomas with a positive genetic test. I will say that I'm not showing you the complicated schema that the nurses and the doctors will use right now, because it is, it is quite complex uh, uh, if you're not working in the field all the time, but there is a flow chart that allows us to arrive at the diagnosis uh, of NF2. So what got changed in these NF2 criteria? Well, in the old criteria, we allowed, uh, if you have a sibling who had NF2, that could count for a point as, as to having NF2. And now we've removed that, the, the sibling from the family history, it can only be involved as a parent who has it. And there's reason to do this because if you have a sibling who has uh, NF2, and then you develop a meningioma, which is the most common uh, brain tumor we encounter, you would currently get diagnosed with NF2. And we think in most situations, that doesn't make sense. And so there are, that criterion got changed and removed. We also specified the types of cataracts that count towards a diagnosis. And that's to recognize that people like me who are over 40 um, get senile cataracts, what that term means. Uh, is age related, uh, and those are not associated with NF2. So we wanted to exclude those to avoid having people be diagnosed with NF2 based on typical cataracts. We also added the presence of an eye finding called the retinal hamartoma, uh, which is a uh, finding that is common in children who present. And we're trying to improve the ability of the diagnostic criteria to identify children who often go a long time without being diagnosed, unfortunately. So we hope that this is gonna to lead to an earlier diagnosis. 
We're also refining the language to say ependymoma, as shown on the image on the right, these little dots inside the spinal cord here, these are ependymomas. Um, and those, uh, that terminology is better than glioma because gliomas can, uh, don't typically occur in the setting of NF2, the gliomas that uh, occur in the brain called high-grade tumors. Most importantly, we've removed neurofibroma from the criteria because they don't occur in the setting of NF2. Most patients tell me, that's crazy, Scott. I was diagnosed with neurofibromas when I was young. And, I, and that is true because a lot of pathologists didn't recognize this difference and, and made mistakes. And so by clarifying this criterion, we hope to improve clinical care and to challenge those pathologists who are diagnosing neurofibromas in the setting of NF2 because it doesn't happen. I'm gonna move on now to schwannomatosis. And to be clear, what I'm talking about is our current di uh, diagnosis of schwannomatosis. Uh, and right now, we don't really have a term uh, for what I'm gonna go with these genetic subtypes, but in the future, we'll have SMARC-B1 related schwannomatosis. Uh, that is uh, schwannomatosis with pathogenic variants in the SMARC-B1 gene, LZTR1-related schwannomatosis, chromosome 22Q-related schwannomatosis. Uh, and, uh, and what this shows you is that um, this uh, genetic testing will be important to have both in the blood, which is straightforward, but if possible, also on tumors. And so we're going to have to engage in a lot of education for surgeons to make sure that they save these tumors for genetic analysis for patients, for those who don't have diagnoses, because these tumors represent the most important source uh, of tissue to identify pathogenic variants. I'll just say, it, and one other point I'll make just in the last few moments is just to emphasize Many of us are spending a lot of time understanding what's the difference between SMARC-B1 related schwannomatosis and LZTR1 related schwannomatosis. Why do we care? And I would argue that in the next 10 to 15 years, maybe sooner, we're going to learn more about what condition, what, what happens to individuals with these different forms of schwannomatosis. Do they have different risks, whether it's a different risk for chronic pain, a different risk for tumor types? Uh, that'll be important information that we hope to collect as we establish these diagnostic criteria. Finally, we recognize that some individuals either may not get genetic testing or the genetic testing may not be informative. And in those individuals, uh, we're gonna use the term schwannomatosis NOS, with, which stands for not otherwise specified. Uh, and in this case, uh, it, it, it can be uh, um, diagnosed based on the presence of two or more uh, lesions uh, that are consistent with schwannomas, uh, and at least one has to be pathologically confirmed. So we're not going to leave anybody out with these revised criteria. If you can't get genetic testing, it's okay. Uh, and you, those individuals would be schwannomatosis NOS. So here's my last slide just to say this is about improving clinical care. And where we see this going is in our field, you'll either have a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis or schwannomatosis. And we think that that basic cl clarification will improve the care of, of patients because no longer can we use the word just neurofibromatosis to mean all three forms of NF. And with that, I wanna particularly thank <clears throat> the Children's Tumor Foundation who has supported this work as well as Patrice Panza well, I'm not sure is on <clears throat> right now, um, but uh, has been totally uh, important um, uh, in making this happen. All the participants of the Delphi, as well as the community and the foundations for helping out. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer some questions whenever the time is right. Great. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, this was an excellent uh, talk. And while we're waiting for more questions to come in, we have already a few in the chat. And I will just start with uh, the first question, which is like, will the reclassification impact research funding? You touched on a little bit on this at the beginning, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit. That's a great question. Uh, very uh, an, an important one. So um, 
of course, I'm not a funder, so I'll start off by that. I can tell you that we have presented this and vetted this with the Department of Defense Neurofibromatosis Research Program, which has provided, I believe, over $300 million for NF research since 1990, 1996. So for sure, they have said that this reclassification will not affect their, uh, their um, funding uh, although it may modify it in the sense that they may use this classification in deciding how to allocate their funding, but they're, they have reassured us and we wouldn't have proceeded if we thought this would endanger funding. So I think the answer to that is no. Will it change anything from foundations? Well, we hope not. I know CTF is on board uh, and other foundations have not, not indicated to us that it would affect funding. So we hope the answer is no. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, how do you think the new classification would affect um, potential clinical trials that are coming up in drugs? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I don't see a, a, a change necessarily in the clinical trials. I do hope that by having more genetic information, it will allow mm -hmm. us to better understand maybe a drug A works better in type of person B uh, or with a certain genetic variant. I think uh, uh, as people probably know that you, Dr. Stanky, are looking at gene therapy. Um, and the more we know about genetics, the more it's gonna help our clinical trials, including gene therapy in the future. So I hope it's good, not bad. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think the more specific information would help us to um, look at uh, effects of drug better. There is a, one other question which is um, uh, uh, related to, to the topic, which is like asking about the connection between NF2 and ring chromosome 22. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that would meet a clinical, if that would meet the criteria. Who is this? But this is a great question. I just, I'm so impressed. With it. That's got to be Gareth Evans. That has to be Gareth. No, 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 it's not. It's, it's not. not. Okay. It's so. not. It's, um, it's like a cat by Kaur Pierce, and she's probably also in the forum here. Well, I'm so happy. It's a great question. Yeah. So just, just to bring people up to speed, a ring chromosome is a type of genetic alteration where DNA forms a ring. And when it happens on chromosome 22, it can cause a disruption in the NF2 gene. So this is really important information. And you are 100% uh, correct that we needed to add information about ring chromosome 22 into these criteria. Um, it, it won't change the criteria. It just reminds people that if you can't find the, the, gen, the genetic change on typical testing, about one to 2% of individual, individuals can have this ring chromosome and that should not be omitted from testing. One thing I didn't talk about, I'll say in one second is, we're gonna to need to work with our genetic testing facilities around the United States to improve the kind of genetic testing that our families and patients get. And that's, that'll be an ongoing effort for us all. Great question. Awesome, awesome. So, um, Great. This is like, this was um, excellent information. I think um, no additional questions um, have come in, but I do want to thank you for this very important update. When, when are the new clinical criteria starting to be in place for everybody? So I'm hoping that we'll finish the manuscript, uh, I would say in the next month or so, and then the publication process usually takes a few months. So we hope by the end of the year. Okay, okay. And Scott, perhaps if you don't mind, one last question from attendee. It's like, apparently at last NF forum last year, there was a general consensus perhaps to rename NF to Merlin syndrome. Um, what has become of that? Um, so you should rephrase, I don't know if there was a consensus. I'll, I'll tell you that there was 100% 100% consensus on nothing. So unfortunately, okay. Um, there was very strong opposition to Merlin um, from uh, a lot of Europeans, as well as there, there's, there's a international group that deals with naming of genes. And there was strong, op they don't allow us to use a lot of names. And so they were discouraging. And so was a lot of the patients in Europe. So um, that, that's why we, we, the thinking behind this is we wanted to retain NF2 in the name if possible. 
Uh, and that's why it came out to be NF2 related schwannomatosis. And we hope that that will retain enough of the NF2 name, which is important to us all, but allow us that flexibility uh, of putting it under schwannomatosis. Great, great. None of these are perfect. We know that, unfortunately. Right. Very good, very good. Um, thank you so much for, for the answer that, um, and thank you so much for your talk. We are moving along with our next session, which will be the poster session and um, discussing exciting research highlight um, during this year's um, neurofibromatosis meeting. The start will be made by Dr. Le Hu and she's an assistant professor and biologist in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Harvard Medical School. Um, her, uh, her work has focused on neuro-oncology and neurofibromatosis. And today she will talk about an exciting study to use losartan as a preventative in tumor-induced hearing loss for our NF2 patients. And before she starts, just as a reminder for everybody to put um, questions into the chat so um, we can uh, discuss those afterwards. Thank you. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Lei. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology here at the Mass General. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see the screen now? Can you see my slides? Yep, everything looks perfect. Oh, it's really my pleasure to share our study. Uh, in the lab with everyone here today. So the title of my talk is um, um, Losartan Prevents Tumor-Induced Hearing Loss and Augment Radiation Efficacy in Schwannoma Mouse Models. Um, so I'll be first giving a brief introduction on the antifibrotic strategy that we use to improve hearing function to prevent hearing loss. And then I'll be presenting um, our data on the Losartan treatment. How does it affect hearing function in our mouse model. And then at the end, I'll be presenting some of data of the uh, Losartan um, in NF2 patients. So the goal of our study is to understand the mechanism that tumor induces hearing loss, and also in this process to identify novel therapeutic strategy to prevent hearing loss. So one of the paper that we found um, that caught our um, attention is um, in this, um, previous study of 274 patients with vestibular schwannoma. This patient, I mean, this paper found that uh, hemorrhage-related fibrosis correlates with hearing loss. So what is fibrosis? Fibrosis is the, uh, is the excessive production of fibros fibrous tissue such as collagen, hyaluronic acid in the tumor microenvironment. Um, just to give a brief introduction on tumor microenvironment. So a solid tumor is composed of uh, cancer cells and the host stromal cells, such as immune cells, inflammatory cells, um, and also intercellular cells, which are nourished by the vasculature, um, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and embedded in an extracellular matrix. So the interaction among these cells with its surrounding matrix um, is called a, sorry. It's called the tumor microenvironment. And this tumor microenvironment, this interaction, the tumor cell, the interaction with the tumor microenvironment influences the tumor progression and also response to therapy. So it has been well documented that in highly fibrotic malignant cancers, uh, the high density of tumor cells uh, together with the high density of tumor matrix such as collagen uh, fibers contributes to a high solid stress. So it's a compressive physical force. And because the tumor blood vessels are structurally abnormal, they collapse under such, easily under such high pressure, resulting in a reduced uh, blood flow uh, that impairs the uh, drug and oxygen delivery and fuels a hypoxic microenvironment, which um, um, the hypoxic cells are more malignant, more aggressive and more resistant to radiation and uh, chemotherapies. Um, however, the role of tumor microenvironment on um, non-malignant tumors such as NF2 are less well understood. So this is a um, video that we took of the tumor blood vessels. You can see that in areas of the tumor, there's a very well blood uh, perfusion, but in areas over here, there's barely any blood perfusion so that you can tell that um, 
uh, the tumor cell sitting over here, there will be um, very uh, limited drug delivery in this area. And then the tumor cells will not be um, killed by the, um, by the treatment and will give uh, rise to a um, uh, recurrence. So one of the, um, we've been trying to develop strategies to relieve the compression on the tumor blood vessels and increase drug delivery and enhance uh, treatment efficacy. So one of the current strategy that we're proposing is to target the matrix to, to use antifibrotic treatment therapy. And we're hoping to lower the solid stress and then decompress the blood vessels. So this way we can normalize the tumor microenvironment, uh, increase drug delivery. So one of the drugs that can reduce the matrix content is called Losartan. So it is an FDA approved antihypertensive that blocks angiotensin signaling. So angiotensin was initially discovered as, as a hormone that controls blood pressure and body fluid homeostasis. Uh, so Losartan blocks the angiotensin binding to its um, receptor. And then uh, it's known that Losartan blocks the uh, fibrogenic signaling, reducing the synthesis of collagen. Uh, so collagen is the major um, uh, collagen um, uh, uh, extracellular matrix molecules in the tumor microenvironment. It also reduces hyaluronic acid, which is another uh, is a glycoprotein, another matrix molecule in the tumor microenvironment. So the first thing that we uh, the first experiment that we did is that we collected some human vestibular schwannoma tumor, uh, tumor samples, and then we confirmed in our sample of uh, the uh, matrix molecules such as collagen one and hyaluronic acids, which are uh, stained in red and also in green in these uh, images here, they are abundantly expressed in schwannomas. So confirming that the target of the sartan are present uh, in patient uh, schwannomas. So next to reproduce the uh, tumor-induced hearing in, in mouse models, we established a uh, cerebellum pontine mouse model. So we injected tumor cells into the brain, uh, into the cerebellum pontine angle, so where the hearing nerve enters the, the ear. So this is an MRI imaging showing the tumor formation in the mouse brain. And this is a histological um, um, analysis demonstrating that the tumor forms right outside the cochlea. So when the tumor grows, uh, it has a chance to affect hearing function. And then with this model, we can test hearing function the same way that we test hearing function in patients that we put electrodes and then we measure the uh, hearing um, function. Uh, so using the mouse model, uh, we treated the mouse model with Losartan. And then we found that with Losartan treatment, the collagen one and hyaluronic acid uh, showing in red and also in uh, green on this panel over here, with Losartan treatment is significantly reduced. So next we evaluated the effects of Losartan on, hear on hearing function. Um, so the mice was implanted with, with tumor cells and then after seven days when the tumor is confirmed, uh, we started Losartan treatment by the daily oral uh, treatment. And then uh, around 21 days, we tested hearing function. So the bottom panel here shows the hearing function in these mice. So the lower the curve indicates the better the hearing. So the green line here shows uh, the hearing in non-tumor bearing mice. So this is the normal hearing um, range. And then with tumor implanted growing in the, in the uh, CPA area, so the mice loses their hearing. So this is shown by elevation of the curve. And then with Losartan treatment shown in the pink curve here. So it, it restored the hearing function to the same level as the normal non-tumor bearing animals. So this study uh, showed that uh, Losartan treatment can prevent it tumor induced hearing loss. And then uh, we did a, uh, um, so in using the NF2 model, we, we did a comprehensive characterization of the molecular mechanisms of how the sartan works. Um, just to summarize um, our findings. So in the mouse model, we found that the sartan treatment reduces the collagen uh, and hyaluronic uh, matrix and normalize the tumor microenvironment. 
So with the, when the tumor microenvironment is normalized, the inflammatory response is reduced. Um, so this way it improved hearing function. And then by normalizing the tumor vasculature, so the sergeant treatment reduces the nerve edema. So that's another possible mechanism that improves hearing function in the mouse model. And also I, I didn't, I'm not showing the data here. So with increased, uh, with better blood perfusion, there's increased oxygen delivery. And oxygen is a very efficient um, radiation sensitizer. So we found that radiation efficacy is improved by the combined Losartan treatments. So this way we can reduce the radiation dose necessary um, to uh, control tumor growth. And uh, at the same time, we can also reduce the radiation uh, toxicity. Uh, so then to prepare the, uh, for the translation of our study to the clinic, my collaborator, Dr. Stankovic's group at Mass Eye Year, they performed a series of retrospective analysis. So um, they selected a, a group of patients um, with vestibular schwannoma, but at the same time, they also have hypertension. And then this patient has been treated at Mass Eye Year uh, during this period of time. So they choose patient that has normal hearing, baseline hearing at the time of diagnosis. So of this patient, seven of them, um, were either already taking Losartan or, or the Losartan type of uh, antihypertensives. And then um, 30 of them were taking other types of uh, antihypertensives such, such as a beta blocker. And eight of them were not taking any uh, antihypertensives. So they did, um, Perform, um, they correlated, uh, they, they studied hearing loss using the coupled mirror uh, curve. So with every um, stairs down, with, that indicates a portion of the patients has lost their hearing function. Uh, so with this um, uh, study, they found that um, in patients taking the certain ARP angiotensin receptor blocker showing in red line here. So zero patients taking the uh, ARP therapy showed any changes in hearing over the course of the follow-up. Whereas the, um, both the threshold of hearing function and also the word recognition, when in those patients that are taking other type of antihypertensives, they deteriorate over time. So in summary that we showed that Lasartan normalizes the extracellular matrix, the tumor microenvironment and improves hearing, um, prevented tumor induced hearing loss in mouse models. And in patient samples, we found that patients receiving angiotensin receptor blockers have no progression in vestibular schwannoma induced hearing loss compared with patients on other types of uh, antihypertensives. So with that, I would like to thank my groups in the Mass General um, Radiation um, Oncology Lab and also my collaborator, Dr. Stankovic's lab in the uh, Mass and Year, and also Dr. Plotkin and uh, Annette Stemmer, um, Rick Nemo from the uh, Neuropathology Department at uh, Mass General. Thank you. Very good. Um, that was an excellent talk. And um, we're still waiting for a few questions to come in. So if anybody in the audience has any questions, please submit them through the chat. I'm going ahead and start with the question. You know, those data are very encouraging to show in the retrospective analyses that uh, patients did not lose hearing while being on Losartan. My question is, how early do you think uh, patients would have to start taking such a medicine? And can this medicine be tolerated well long-term at the doses needed? Well, um, Losartan has, is very well tolerated, I think. Has very, um, it's, it's been used in the clinic for years and then its safety is, is well uh, characterized. In terms of the timing of taking Losartan, uh, so we, we do have Losartan clinical trials in pancreatic tumors. So in those patients we, sh we saw um, with short-term Losartan treatment, there's decreased uh, extracellular matrix content and improved um, chances of a surgical uh, removal of the pancreatic tumor. So in terms of the uh, um, exact time 
that patient should take in the lasartan. Mm -hmm. I don't have any um, suggestions on that. I, um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that Dr. Plotkin will be uh, interested in uh, starting a clinical trial sometimes um, mm -hmm. at MGH. Okay, that sounds great. But we should just emphasize, we don't think people should jump on this medicine based on this data. We'd like to, you know, if your doctor thinks it's appropriate for you, it's one thing, but we would not encourage people to do this without speaking with their physicians. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, another question uh, that has come up through the chat is, does Lucertin help to reduce tumor growth or size? or is it primarily a function to improve symptoms such as hearing loss? So in our mouse study, we found that Lasertin does not affect tumor size, does not affect tumor growth. Mm -hmm. So its function is normal, is, is uh, through its action on the tumor microenvironment by reducing the matrix, normalizes the uh, tumor vasculature, improves vessel perfusion. Mm -hmm. Do you also feel that like an anti-inflammatory component uh, plays a role here? I do. I do believe yeah. that. And that's something that we're currently studying right now. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. I think um, this was an excellent talk. It's certainly very exciting news um, and uh, potentially, you know, a new treatment on the horizon. We are um, out of time and we'll move on to the next speaker, which will be um, Naomi Askanazi. She is um, a psychologist and her in is very interested in pain. She um, has done some exciting work on the longitudinal pain evaluation in the schwannomatosis population, which she is going to share share with us today. Yes, here, let me try and share my screen. Right. Here we go. Uh, can you guys see this? Yep, all is great. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Naomi Skenazi, and I have the honor today to be presenting on behalf of my colleagues in Manchester and Boston about the longitudinal evaluation of pain in schwannomatosis patients. Okay, I have no disclosures report. So before we start, it is important to note that patients with schwannomatosis are prone to chronic pain. So this is the most common symptom and is um, debilitating and detrimental to physical and mental health. Uh, regardless of any pain management that patients may take, so surgery or pain medications, most patients will not become pain-free. So there is a current unmet medical need for better pain medications for these patients. So we had two main aims in the study. Uh, the first was to collect and analyze data on pain experience and pain-related outcomes. So they are the following. They are pain intensity or severity of the pain, pain interference, so impact of pain on a person's daily life, pain self-efficacy, so confidence to achieve daily goals despite pain, and psychosocial impact, so things like anxiety and depression. Uh, the second goal is to be able to inform clinical trial design for schwannomatosis-related pain. So by better understanding what a patient's pain with, schwann with schwannomatosis looks like, we will be able to deem whether a um, clinical trial drug has been effective or not. So if we understand what uh, normal schwannomatosis pain looks like, we can see whether it has been improved in a clinical trial. Uh, the recruitment part of this study was done through the International Schwannomatosis Registry, which is a database of patients who are willing to participate in studies like these. Uh, we recruited 79 adult patients through Mass General, New York University, Johns Hopkins and University of Manchester, and this all began in November, 2015. Uh, patients were sent online questionnaires every six months for up to five years. These questionnaires are broken into two parts. The first covers demographic and clinical information. So this is things like age, race, gender, familial inheritance of schwannomatosis, as well as the type of drugs they may be taking. So opioids, neuropathic meds, or anti-inflammatory drugs and then any kind of schwannomatosis related surgeries. Uh, the second half of this questionnaire um, covers patient reported pain related outcomes. So these are things, these are questionnaires that ask you to rank things like worst pain intensity, 
pain quality, pain self-efficacy, physical functioning, anxiety, depression, sorry, and pain interference. Um, in the ranking, the higher, the higher you score means the more of that quality you have. So if you rank higher in worse pain intensity, the more severe your pain is. If you rank higher in physical functioning, the better your function is. So in order to analyze the data that we collected from these questionnaires, we had to first define the clinically meaningful change. So this is what difference or what value in scores would be considered to be impactful in a patient's life. So based on previously published literature, we decided to use a difference of two or more in pain intensity and pain self-efficacy and a difference of five or more in promise measures. So um, just to give an example, if a patient had a score of two at time point one and then a pain intensity score of five at time point two, they would have been considered to have a clinically meaningful change because they had a difference of two or more between the two time points. Uh, we also used um, correlations to, uh, we studied the correlations between pain intensity and other outcome measures. Uh, at baseline, there were 79 participants, 58% of which were female, with a minimum age of 30 and a maximum age of 78, and an average of 51. 77% uh, of patients were using pain medication, uh, a couple of which were taking more than one medication at a time. Um, on the right here is a table of the measurements and the average at baseline. So as you can see, all these numbers are about uh, average or about midpoint of, of uh, what we had expected, except for pain interference, which is about six higher than the US population score of 50. Um, here is a box plot which shows the pain intensity scores at each interval by time and months. So time and months is on the x-axis or the interval, and the pain score is on the y, where the higher you are, the more pain you are in. Uh, here is the number of patients who have participated in each of the time points. The red diamonds and the blue dashes represent means and medians respectively. And as we can see, the means and medians stay relatively stable throughout the entire trial. Uh, this doesn't account for individual scores, which as you can see here, fluctuate a lot. A lot. So there are um, patients who have pain intensity scores that range from one all the way to 10 and back down to three, and they would definitely be considered to have a clinically meaningful change. Uh, here there are two patients who don't have as much fluctuation and yet would still be considered to have a clinically meaningful change um, with the standard that we had set before. Um, finally, here is a slide of some other schwannomatosis symptoms that we found. Uh, we uh, calculated that the more pain intensity you have, the more pain interference, ID pain, depression, and anxiety you have. So a higher score is correlated with more depression symptoms. Uh, we found the opposite for physical functioning and pain self-efficacy, so that the higher your pain intensity scores, the less physical functioning you have. Um, here is a table of pain-related outcomes and the percentage of patients who have worsened, stable, and improved scores. And as you can see from the amount of green bar in each of these pain-related outcomes, the majority of patients are stable at one year. In conclusion, pain severely affects the physical and mental health of people with schwannomatosis. And regardless of pain management, pain intensity tends to remain high. Uh, over time, group averages for pain intensity stay stable but individual scores fluctuate. Um, this information is currently being used for the first trial for schwannomatosis related pain, which Jennifer Dow will be presenting about next. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all my colleagues at Mass General and University of Manchester, as well as the Tumor Foundation. Uh, big thank you to all the participants for taking the time to answer all the questionnaires. And also big thank you to Vanessa Merker, Jennifer Da, and Scott Bakken for helping me and all their mentorship. Okay. Great. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, excellent talk and uh, keeping us on time. Um, we have uh, one a question uh, submitted from an attendee, uh, which is, will there be a study on pain with children or young adults as well? 
Uh, I am not sure about that, but I think that could be a, a great idea because we don't have any uh, children included in this study, so it could be interesting to see what difference that may hold. Mm -hmm. Let me just add one that, to that a little bit. Just because the, the average individual with schwannomatosis gets diagnosed in their 30s or 40s, so it turns out that we're open to uh, a study for children, but we don't have, I'd say less than 5% or less than 1% of people with schwannomatosis or younger than 18 that we know about. So uh, if you have ideas about whether this is important, let us know and we can think more about it. Great, great, super, super. And um, perhaps um, one question would be, were there any um, uh, particular challenges in, um, you know, evaluating the longitudinal pain in patients with schwannomatosis, given that they may have pain in different spots of their body? Um, yeah, well, this, uh, the questionnaires that were asked um, only asked about uh, worst pain intensity in the past week. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there could be a lot of room to grow in the types of questionnaires that we ask and uh, the type of pain that it covers. So maybe the past month or like you said, which spots in the body. Mm -hmm. And are there any plans to kind of do those studies as well? Uh, I am not sure about that at the moment. Okay, okay, perfect. And if a patient would be interested participating in uh, such studies, who, who would they... How, how would they know about these studies? Uh, I said, uh, let, let me take that one if you don't mind, just because it's through the International Schwannomatosis Registry. So that's something mm -hmm. run out of Johns Hopkins. That's so you, you can look that up. And then also you can contact Naomi or the rest of our team uh, to, and we can help you with that. But um, there are restrictions on how we can do it, but thank you for the interest if, if for those who are interested. Great, super, very good. Then um, we're moving on to our last research talk of the day, which um, is also coming um, from Boston. This is a Boston um, uh, uh, focused um, session, as it appears. The next speaker will be uh, Jennifer Da. She is a research coordinator at Mass General, working very closely with uh, Dr. Scott Plotkin, who we have heard earlier. Um, she will be presenting their results on the efficacy and safety of a new drug called tanezumab in patients with moderate to severe schwannomatosis related pain. Take it away. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Today I will be introducing a phase two trial for schwannomatosis related pain on behalf of my team members at Mass General, the National Cancer Institute, and Pfizer. I have no disclosures. Um, Pfizer has provided support and study drug. So as everyone here knows, chronic pain is a common symptom of schwannomatosis. And as we have just seen from Naomi Askenazi's presentation, currently available pain medications are often ineffective at treating this pain. So there is a clear need for new pain medications that can effectively treat pain in schwannomatosis. When designing clinical trials for schwannomatosis related pain, there are several unique challenges that must be considered. The rarity of schwannomatosis makes it challenging to recruit enough patients to participate in the study. The natural fluctuations in pain intensity that patients experience over time can make it difficult to measure the effectiveness of a pain medication. Randomized control trials are considered the gold standard of clinical trial design. In this type of trial, some patients will be randomly selected to receive placebo. Um, however, but we must balance the desire for optimal trial design with ethical considerations given the lack of effective treatment options. So the study I will be introducing today is the first therapeutic trial in schwannomatosis related pain and attempts to address these challenges. So as we just saw in the last presentation, schwannomatosis patients report taking many types of pain medications, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, neuropathic pain medications like Lyrica, um, and opioids. Many patients report taking a combination of these medications with limited relief. This limited efficacy, coupled with the increasing stigma around opioid, opioid use in the US, present a need for novel non-opioid therapies. Nerve growth factor 
is um, a molecule in the body that generates pain. And we hypothesize that it also plays an important role in schwannomatosis related pain. Tenazumab is an unapproved drug that inhibits or blocks NGF. Its safety and efficacy has been studied across multiple types of pain thus far. In this phase two trial, we will be investigating the safety and efficacy of tenazumab in treating schwannomatosis related pain. The study is open to enrollment at Massachusetts General Hospital with the goal of enrolling 46 participants. So to address the challenges and ethical considerations mentioned earlier regarding trial design, the study is divided into two phases. In the first phase, which is the double blind treatment phase, participants will be randomly selected to receive either tenazumab or placebo. Both the study team and participant will be blinded, so no one will know, um, you know whether the participant received tenazumab or placebo in this phase. Subsequently, during the single arm treatment phase, everyone will receive tenazumab. To help improve recruitment and cut down on the logistical burdens of participating, the use of telemedicine has also been incorporated into this study. To be eligible for this study, participants must have a diagnosis of schwannomatosis, be at least 18 years old, and have moderate to severe schwannomatosis related pain despite taking pain medications. Diagnosis of osteoarthritis, having symptoms um, or problematic dizziness, blood pressure problems, um, or abnormal heart rhythm, or an inability to discontinue use of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may make someone ineligible to participate. And just a note here that participants will generally be able to take all other types of pain medications while on the study aside from the NSAIDs. The primary endpoint or outcome in the study is the change in worst pain intensity as measured by the numeric rating scale 11. So this is a scale where participants are asked to rate their worst pain intensity from zero to 10, where zero represents um, no pain and 10 represents the worst pain ever. Secondary endpoints include the frequency of side effects and also we will be monitoring neurocognitive function. A number of exploratory assessments have also been incorporated into the study. Um, so participants complete weekly electronic surveys of worst pain location and intensity. The image to the right here shows an example of the body map where participants indicate the location of their worst pain. So just a moment here, I will play a reel with some illustrative data. Um, so here I go. So you can see this reel is meant to give everyone an example of how the location of worst pain could evolve over time and the type of data that we're hoping to capture in this study. Other outcomes we hope to capture include patient reported pain interference, pain related anxiety and depression. We'll also be interviewing patients on trial to better understand the complexities of a patient's pain experience. Dr. Vanessa Merker at Mass General will be leading those efforts. And ultimately, we hope this data will help us select drugs that target the aspects of pain that matter most to patients and um, adapt our outcome measures to more accurately and precisely assess benefit. We will also be conducting other analyses to see how pain intensity may be related to genetic markers, nerve growth factor levels in the blood, and also tenazumab levels in the blood. We have cast a wide net to maximize recruitment outreach. Information about the study has been shared with the CTF NF registry, international schwannomatosis registry, and patients at the NF clinic at Mass General. As of June 7th, 36 participants um, have been screened or are being screened and seven are enrolled in the study. We've hit some roadblocks in our efforts to recruit participants. So we would love to hear feedback about how we can improve outreach and recruit more participants. Um, if anyone has any suggestions, we would love to hear from you. Our team is also collecting feedback to better understand the barriers to participation in schwannomatosis clinical trials. We've heard common barriers include hesitancy to come into the clinic due to, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, concerns with travel costs and logistics, and preferences for other treatment modalities such as surgery. We have attempted to solve for some of these challenges related to the rarity of schwannomatosis. So the Children's Tumor Foundation has generously 
offered to cover a portion of travel costs for participants in this trial. Um, we've also included telephone visits and electronic surveys so pa uh, patients can participate remotely um, at some of the time points in the study. So this trial is currently open and enrolling at Massachusetts General Hospital. There's plenty of space, so if anyone is interested in participating, um, we're definitely open to enrolling more participants. Next steps include completing accrual. The findings from the interviews and exploratory assessments will inform future trials for schwannomatosis-related pain. And lastly, although outside of the scope of this presentation today, I just wanted to highlight that there are other trials in development for schwannomatosis um, in the future, so in both the US and EU. So I want to thank all of my team members at Mass General, the National Cancer Institute, and Pfizer for their support and guidance. I would like to particularly thank Dr. Plotkin and Dr. Merker for their mentorship. And thank you to the Children's Tumor Foundation for giving us this opportunity to present today. And most importantly, thank you to all of our participants. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, this was another excellent talk. Um, and um, a perfect ending to our uh, three research topics. Um, we are still waiting for questions in the chat, but um, let me start by asking you, um, what is, you know, you mentioned the patient uh, recruitment issue. What is the, the minimum age of, of patients that are recruited for the study? Sure, so the minimum age is 18. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, very good. And um, and uh, patients, uh, you you mentioned um, how how much time would patients um, have to uh, have to have to spend? You know, have to put in to come to the site or do those a questionnaire. How often would they ask to be doing things? Yes. So in terms of the in person visits, um, they're roughly once every two months. In between those visits, there are, you know, five to 10 minute telephone calls about once every two weeks to a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also do have these weekly electronic surveys, but they usually, um, there's only three questions. So they usually take people, you know, a few minutes to complete. Okay. Very good. Very good. Another question came in, uh, which is asking about how the drug is being administered. So the drug is administered subcutaneously. Um, it's a pretty quick, you know, shot, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I assume patients will get trained how to do that. The drug is administered by um, the research team, actually. So it would be okay. the hospital and patients are monitored afterwards. I see. I see. Very good. Very good. Well, I hope that um, some of um, our schwannomatosis uh, patients have... Um, you know, heard this talk or are able to see um, the video in order to kind of help recruitment um, for you, uh, for your study, which is, you know, the first one and certainly um, a very important step in that direction. Um, are there any complications that you have seen um, with this medication? So um, generally, we haven't had too many um, I would say major complications that we've seen from the past studies, there are some rare side effects, um, mm -hmm. such as rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. But for this trial, because we're aware of these side effects, um, one of the exclusion criteria would be if you do have arthritis, you wouldn't be eligible to participate. Right. So we've tried to mitigate the risks in that way. Great, great. Great. I think um, that looks all very promising. And um, we hope that um, your talk will reach a broad patient's audience and we can help uh, your recruitment. Um, I, we are um, out of time. So if there are any more questions regarding this very exciting uh, clinical trial, please submit it through the chat. And uh, if, you know, if you see any questions, feel free to answer those. We are moving on with um, with the next uh, section, which is um, focusing around, um, you know, the clinical care of patients with NF2 and um, and schwannomatosis, um, I uh, will be making 
giving the first talk for just like a brief general introduction to the uh, clinical uh, care for NF2 and uh, two other exciting talks um, will, will then follow. So um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going ahead with, with the presentation. Um, so um, although NF2 was originally thought to be a quite rare, the use of uh, the clinical criteria and the genetic testing led actually to the recognition that it is more common than previously thought and that greater than half of patients represent spontaneous, uh, um, a spontaneous um, uh, a condition and occur in the absence of a positive family history. Uh, patients typically present around 20 years of age. Initial or presenting symptoms can vary very much. Um, in childhood, patients typically present with non-hearing related issues such as visual and eye problems, weakness, pain, neuropathy, cutaneous tumor and seizures. Um, uh, children diagnosed with NF2 often have an atypical but more severe presentation. This is very different in adult patients where hearing loss and tinnitus are the most common presenting symptoms. And um, often we use a detailed molecular testing to identify an abnormality of um, NF2, um, which you know occurs in um, is is successful in 93% of the families where multiple members are affected, but less so in, in, in cases of spontaneous NF2 mutations. The uh, genetic testing is especially valuable in, in children that um, present often with unusual symptoms and lack um, NF2 specific findings. I also want to note here that within a family, symptoms and the natural history of disease is often Often very similar, but it may vary a lot between families when they harbor different types of NF2 abnormalities. The management of patients with NF2 is very complex and it involves multiple disciplines to prevent or treat the various complications that could develop. Whenever possible, patients should be cared for at, uh, by a multidisciplinary team with expertise in the care of NF2. The team should include, for example, a neurosurgeon, a neuroautologist, a neuroradiologist, a neurologist, an audiologist, geneticist, and other specialties that are needed specifically with that individual. The most common manifestation are bilateral vestibular schwannomas, which occur in almost all of the patients, intracranial and spinal meningiomas um, also occur, um, we often see spinal tumors, including ependymomas, and those occur in more than half of the NF2 patients. Patients with NF2 may also have non-tumor symptoms, um, such as visual impairments due to cataracts, um, retinal hematomas or epiretinal membranes. Cataracts are seen quite frequently in like 60 to 80% of patients. And um, development of cataracts or other ocular manifestations can lead to visual abnormalities already in early childhood. Approximately 70% of patients with NF2 have cutaneous manifestations, although only very few patients have more than 10 skin tumors. And that is very different than, for example, NF1, where we see a lot of skin tumors. And these skin lesions can take uh, several forms, um, like plaque-like lesions, which are intracutaneous and slightly raised and are shown here, or they can be subcutaneous nodules, or have those like brown scoped spots, which you see on the slides, which are more irregular looking than, um, for example, the caffeolay spots you see in NF1. Uh, vestibular schwannomas in NF2 are typically bilateral and cause tinnitus, hearing loss, and um, balance um, dysfunction. The onset of hearing loss is usually gradually, 
and uh, progressive and leads to deafness, although sudden hearing loss can occur as well. The mechanism of hearing loss from vestibular schwannoma and NF2 is not well understood yet, and there is poor correlation between tumor size and growth rate and the degree of hearing loss. The hearing impairment is unfortunately associated with a decreased quality of life, increased risk for social avoidance, unemployment, and uh, decreased social support. And really the goal in our clinic of treatment um, is the preservation of function and the maintenance of quality of life. And as such, the identification of a tumor per se is not an indicator for treatment and the potential benefits must be balanced against the risks of interventions. Um, vestibular schwannomas are typically monitored with at least yearly MRIs and regular audiologic assessments. Treatment is usually indicated when there is a risk of like brainstem compression because these tumors can get really large, a deterioration of hearing, and uh, facial nerve dysfunction, which it can sometimes cause. Um, one of the exciting uh, findings over the last uh, few years was Bevacizumab or Avastin, which is a monoclonal antibody against vascular endothelial growth factor. And that has been shown to induce both tumor shrinkage and hearing improvement in patients with NF2 associated vestibular schwannoma. There is um, growing experience of using bevacizumab as a first line medically, medical therapy for um, rapidly growing vestibular schwannomas or patients who experience a new hearing loss before committing them to surgery. And in one study, the tumor shrunk um, in 41% of the patients and hearing improved in 20% in of the patients. However, this treatment appears to be working quite well in like in adults. Uh, unfortunately, we have not had uh, much success in, in younger patients um, that are younger than 20 years of age. Um, the NF2 um, mutation appears to affect many different molecular pathways involving cell growth. Um, the understanding of this uh, provides also the opportunity for other targeted therapies. Um, in the past and currently, we have used um, uh, Everolimus, which is an oral inhibitor of the mammalian target of rapamycin complex one. Um, and um, Everolimus has resulted in, in, in mixed report, but has been tried. Lapatinib is another medication that has been used. Um, however, there's lots, um, there are lots of new medications that have been um, identified in laboratories and excitingly a clinical trial um, of the anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, brigatinib uh, has, been, uh, has been launched and um, looks very promising. Since the treatment of those vestibular schwannomas and certainly other tumors as well is very challenging, opportunities for chemoprophylaxis, which means administering a medication in order to prevent tumor growth and a future chemotherapy have been explored. And those medications need to be tolerated well and given over long periods of time. Aspirin and celecoxib have been investigated for that purpose, while aspirin um, is currently in trial. Celecoxib has only been used on select patients and has not been systematically investigated. In addition to uh, drugs, there are other supportive therapies that can help cope with symptoms related to vestibular schwannomas. Those include vestibular rehab, which can address balance issues and reduce dizziness and vertigo. There is like um, lip reading and sign language to cope with severe hearing impairment. Uh, um, then there's also physical therapy to help maintain um, muscle strength and mobility. 
Aside from those non-surgical treatments, there are surgical treatments, which um, are still play a very, very important role in taking care of these patients. Um, for patients with severe hearing impairment strategies, such as like cochlear or brainstem implants may offer some benefits. The role of radiation in those tumors is unclear, mainly due to the fact, uh, in part also due to the fact that there is a concern for a secondary malignancy uh, due to the underlying um, um, uh, genetic change in, in NF2. So um, the next tumor I quickly want to talk about are uh, meningiomas, which occur also in about half of the patients. Usually they are mold, often they are multiple. They can, um, the incidence can increase with age. And most meningiomas uh, are uh, intracranial. Some of them can also um, present um, uh, in the spine. And uh, frequently children are diagnosed with that during childhood and about 20% of children that have them in childhood end up being diagnosed with NF2 at some point later on. Often these meningiomas can grow to a certain size and then stop. And uh, therefore uh, not all, again, similar to vestibular schwannomas, not all of these tumors need to be treated right away when they're found, but only when there actually is progressive growth or those that threaten functional loss. Again, surgery is um, the, um, the, the treatment of choice whenever possible, and other treatments like radiation um, uh, are um, are used when surgery is not possible. But again, there is a concern for a secondary malignancy due to, um, due to the underlying problem in NF1. Uh, very excitingly, in the last years, uh, targeted therapies have been identified, which are currently uh, undergoing investigation in form of a clinical trial. So hopefully we'll have some better treatments available very soon. The last um, tumor I quickly want to uh, touch on are spinal tumors. Um, uh, they can cause debilitating pain, muscle weakness, paresthesias. Um, uh, some of these spinal tumors are uh, so-called ependymomas. They are uh, often found in screening imaging studies and usually grow very slowly uh, without symptoms for long periods of time. And therefore careful neurologic surveillance for evidence of progression is indicated. And uh, if, um, um, if treatment is needed, uh, usually um, surgical resection is, um, is, is treatment of choice. There's also some evidence that the cystic elements of these tumors may respond well to um, bevacizumab. Because of the occurrence of all these different uh, lesions and symptoms, um, patients are recommended to undergo tumor surveillance uh, regularly. And this includes a list of um, uh, uh, several non-invasive exams, which I have listed here, such as uh, annual history, neurologic exam, cutaneous exam, the eye exam, and regular uh, testing of the hearing capability. Um, in addition to that, um, annual brain imaging um, is conducted in patients uh, older than 10 years old. And um, if imaging does not show any involvement, we typically screen patients every two years. If tumors are detected, we follow them closely um, as needed. Uh, similarly, we um, image the spine um, and in, in children starting from the age of 10. Um, and similarly to the brain, if tumors, if node involvement is detected, we, um, uh, we, we follow up with imaging every two to five years. If tumors are detected, we um, perform imaging as needed, but typically uh, twice um, yearly for the first year and then annually. Some centers do use whole body MRIs, um, including um, the brain and spine uh, for surveillance, which gives the um, advantage of um, characterizing uh, different tumors in different areas of the body with just one exam. Um, 
you know, overall, uh, because um, vestibular schwannomas are on both sides, lots of patients become um, deaf. And because of the poor balance, these patients have uh, visual problems, often like muscle weakness. A lot of them are wheelchair bound in early adulthood. And um, however, with, um, with the improvement um, of, um, of, of, of therapy, uh, patients do much better these days uh, than, than, than uh, 40 years ago. In the 1980s, the average patient age was uh, th in, in their 30s. Uh, these days, um, patients do, um, do much, much better um, uh, it, 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 because of the advances in treatments that have been made. And we ho hopefully continue to make the diagnosis even earlier and continue to advance uh, treatments to um, Im further improve outcomes. And then last but not least, I just quickly want to mention that there is a screening also available for families, uh, for family members of uh, patients that have been um, diagnosed uh, with NF2. Uh, this usually includes uh, the screening of first degree family members. And how do we screen? We screen with genetic testing or screening MRIs of the brain and spine as the genetic testing is not 100%. Um, so this, um, I think I'm out of time. This um, uh, um, uh, concludes um, the brief overview of um, the care of patients um, with NF2. And I uh, welcome um, any questions. Perfect. Okay, I'm just like looking at the chat. So we have a question here um, that says, um, my son was diagnosed with his first tumor at the age of two. He has many tumors and uh, uh, now at age 11, is there an estimated lifespan for those who are identified at uh, such a young age who grew so many uh, young and any medications that are explored for trial? So, you know, so there is, um, you know, I, I always like to say to, to patients that, um, you know, we, we do use statistics uh, often to, um, to, to provide like an idea of, of how, things, how things are going. But at the end of the day, um, every patient is an individual. And so we, are not very good at estimating at estimating lifespan. I think um, what is important to remember is that treatments these days are very different than 30 years ago when these lifespans were estimated. So I think um, you know the goal certainly of the surveillance exam is to catch complications very very early on, and to minimize the effects they have um, uh, on life. And we do this. Um, with medications that are known, and to come to the second part of your questions, with medications that are new, that developed um, uh, uh, out of the labs, because we know now so much more about the biology um, of these tumors. And um, there are indeed medications that um, are being looked at uh, for, for children, and uh, those medications uh, are, uh, are uh, tumor specific, um, uh, meaning they require a certain, a certain type of tumor. Sometimes sometimes they require the, the, the tumor to have a certain growth patterns, but um, more and more um, uh, during those, uh, with, with the advancement of knowledge and children will be included into these studies so that more and more treatment uh, will be available. Yeah. Um, then, um, yeah. Um, uh, um, the um, one other question is like, uh, what is recommended for brachial plexus tumors? Um, you know, this is also a very good question, but depends very much um, uh, on the um, on, on, on the clinical uh, setting. So, um, you know, it depends, uh, the recommendations depend a lot whether the tumor, whether the tumor is growing, whether the tumor um, has caused any, uh, any functional deficit. And uh, those factors will be used um, to guide um, 
to guide uh, therapies. Um, I think it's very important that um, these patients see specialists who are very experienced um, uh, in these conditions, you know, Although NF2 is much more frequent than what we initially thought, it is still a, a rare condition and it's important that uh, that person seeks care in like uh, centers um, that have experience with the treatment in order to avoid um, to avoid overtreatment, but also um, to um, a, get the patient to the um, to the best uh, treatment at this at this point. Um, I think um, given the time, we uh, have to move on with, with our next speaker, which um, will be, uh, which will be uh, Heather Thompson. And um, I see there is one more question in the chat that I will be uh, answering uh, during the talk. Um, but um, Dr. Thompson, um, she will be giving the next talk. She's an associate professor and uh, the acting chair at uh, Sacramento State uh, University uh, in the speech language department. She is a very rare language uh, expert um, who focuses her work on the research to improve communication strategies for patients with hearing impairments. And one of her focus is our, uh, are our NF2 patients. And today she will talk about uh, this important topic to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. So for this presentation, I'm going to describe communication and swallowing concerns associated with NF2, discuss intervention options for communication concerns in NF2, and then end with communication strategies for individuals with NF2. So first off, what is a communication disorder? Well, it's an impairment in the ability to receive, send, process, and comprehend concepts or verbal, nonverbal, and graphic symbol systems. Individuals can have communication disorder across the lifespan, and these communication disorders can be mild to profound. Because the same mechanism that's used for speech is also used for swallowing, it is important to discuss a speech language pathology scope of practice called dysphagia. And this refers to difficulty in moving food from the mouth to the stomach without having inappropriate loss out of the lips or into the airway. So if we're gonna talk about communication and communication challenges, it's important that we first talk about what is communication. So first off, when we're in a communicative interaction, we have an input. So this is information from the environment and we can have communication happen in the visual modality when we see someone, we can hear, communication when someone speaks to us. We can also receive information tactilely. So for example, an individual with a visual challenge may use Braille. We also have an output when we're engaged in a communication exchange. And this may be uh, in the graphic modality when we send or write a text or write a note. We can speak and have an output through the verbal modality. And we can also engage in gestural communication, such as use sign language, or even communicate gesturally um, in everyday communication by waving or giving a thumbs up, for example. Input goes into our brain, gets integrated and processed, and then we develop a speech motor program or plan and a way to communicate verbally. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to talk briefly about input through the auditory modality and output through the verbal modality or a gestural system. So when we're talking about input, first we have to think about our auditory system. We take sound through the environment, through the external auditory canal, through the middle ear, inner ear, and then that sound is transmitted up through the eighth cranial nerve or the cochlear nerve. So when we're speaking, we have feedback from our own speech and we're hearing ourselves produce that speech. And so certainly in the presence of an acoustic neuroma or other um, type of tumor that may reduce that signal to the brain and actually have an impact on later speech production. 
When we're thinking about speech production or output, we have to think about our oral mechanism. When we're communicating orally, there are four valves in our oral anatomy that come together at different times to allow us to modify the airstream from the lungs out past our oral structures and past our lips. Our first valve is our lips and that opens and closes to produce speech. Our tongue can raise or lower and actually articulate or um, go against our hard palate or the roof of our mouth. And that helps us to modify the airstream. Our, um, the back of our tongue can go up and hit our soft palate. And our soft palate or the soft portion of the roof of our mouth actually elevates to move against the back of our throat or our posterior pharyngeal wall. And it can close off the airway leading to our nose during the production of some speech sounds. Um, so that allows us to make different types of speech sounds. Our fourth valve is our vocal folds or our vocal cords, which open and close and vibrate to allow us to produce different types of consonants. So for example, when we say a f sound like F, um, our vocal folds are open. And when we produce a v sound like V, our vocal folds vibrate. And so together we modify the airstream using these four valves. So there's different communication considerations and concerns. Um, individuals can have articulation concerns um, in the area of speech. Individuals can have disfluency or stuttering. Quality of voice can also be impacted, certainly if there's a tumor in the oral anatomy. And just like individuals without NF1 can have a, an expressive or receptive language impairment, individuals with NF2 rather can have a language concern as well. We know that hearing is oftentimes affected. And individuals can also have central auditory processing concerns where an individual may score within normal limits on a standardized hearing evaluation and yet have difficulties with listening. And so a central auditory processing evaluation will allow an individual to have um, their ability at segmenting and decoding information that is heard using language knowledge. And so that evaluation can take place. When we're evaluating communication concerns, it's also important that we think about communication variations. So this may mean um, an individual comes in with differences in communication. So um, our patients may be multilingual and have a variety of languages that they speak. As a speech language pathologist, when we're engaging in these assessments, we need to be able to assess in all languages spoken to really look at a person's communication functioning. Similarly, if an individual uses an augmentative alternative communication device like an iPad or a related technology to communicate, that communication variation needs to be taken into consideration. Okay, so communication concerns in NF2 um, can be related to the location of a tumor, surgery, medication, and other factors. We know that individuals with NF2 can exhibit facial paralysis or weakness. And so if they have, um, if individuals have weakness of the oral anatomy, that can lead to speech concerns and also can contribute to swallowing concerns as well. So as I mentioned previously, there's many different concerns in NF2. An additional one that I haven't yet spoken about is nasality. So certainly if there is a tumor at the level of the nasopharynx or at the soft palate, that may impact a person's nasal resonance and they may appear more nasal in their speech. And so these things are other factors that we wanna consider in, as part of an assessment for communication concerns in NF2. Finally, if an individual has dysphagia, they may have different um, communication barriers in that um, difficulties with swallowing may affect activities of daily living. And so that's something else to consider on a daily basis. So care for children with NF2, what are some intervention outcomes? We know that children with NF2 may have a more variable or severe presentation. We also know that around four to 25% of children under the age of 18 do present with hearing concerns. And yet children with NF2 may be more likely to be identified with visual or neurological symptoms than their hearing concerns. 
it is important that an interdisciplinary team conduct an evaluation for these children. And if communication concerns are identified, that that child be referred for an evaluation by a speech language pathologist or an audiologist. And audiological evaluation should include a functional audiological assessment. So in terms of an assessment across the lifespan, uh, and a speech language pathologist can conduct an evaluation of speech, language, hearing, communication, and swallowing. And an audiologist can provide special guidance around hearing concerns in collaboration with an interdisciplinary team. In terms of intervention, there are several different options for speech language services. You can uh, experience speech intervention for specific articulation concerns language intervention for improving understanding and production of long complex sentences. Cognitive communication therapy can help with language um, concerns that are more advanced and have a medical basis. And what I'll talk about a little bit today is audiological rehabilitation and facilitative communication strategies. One thing that's important to consider is a discussion of the use of sign language. Sometimes individuals would like to know when should sign language be used and if at all. And so one thing as part of our assessment to look at is the family or patient's preferred communication mode. So we do know that sign language um, is available as a manual system of communication that's expressed through changes in hand configuration, orientation, location, and movement. There are hundreds of sign languages available throughout the world. And there's different viewpoints on the use of ASL. For example, individuals from the deaf community maintain a specific culture associated with ASL and may not need or view a use of oral oral communication as a component of their, uh, their communication. However, others may consider a bilingual aspect to meet communication as very helpful. And so it really depends on the family's viewpoints and what they would like to do moving forward. One thing that is important to note is that sign language requires, the, uh, requires conversational partners and the whole family really needs to learn that sign language if that's to be used. However, communication modes need to be considered. And so we would work with families to learn and find out whether the family prefers to use primarily speech or would they like to use manually coded English and speech or sign only. And so as care providers, we really wanna have this conversation and determine what the family would like to do. Oral rehabilitation refers to um, the procedure of restoring or optimizing people's participation in, in activities that have been limited as a result of hearing loss. Speech language pathologists and audiologists can provide oral rehabilitation services. And in general, oral rehabilitation can initiate when an individual transitions to use a new device or when a change in hearing takes place. Um, audiological rehabilitation is composed of four main things, um, including listening devices and technology, uh, auditory only speech perception and auditory training, audiovisual speech perception and speech reading training, and communication strategies. I'm gonna go over these very briefly and there's more information presented on the slides and I'll have time to discuss today, um, but this is just to give you a brief overview. So of course, listening devices and technology may include hearing aids, auditory brainstem implants and cochlear implants. And these can be used with and without uh, oral rehabilitation strategies through behavioral therapy. Auditory only speech perception and auditory training um, is set to really develop patient speech recognition skills using listening ability. And so this can be used in conjunction with amplification. In general, therapy involves two different approaches. Uh, an analytic approach really would allow the patient to learn to recognize individual differences in speech sounds. So uh, using a barrier or shield in front of the face we provide uh, opportunities for listening and comparing two different words. For example, a therapist might present the word pop and top, and the patient would listen and try and distinguish if those two words sounded same or different. A synthetic approach is a little bit different, and it emphasizes overall understanding of meaning of text. So the therapy would involve 
the therapist presenting paragraphs of information with follow-up questions, and listening practice is engaged to determine if the individual can abstract the meaning or take away the meaning from the paragraph that is read. Audiovisual speech perception and speech reading training is really set to promote um, a, an individual's use of both auditory and visual signals, as well as facial expressions, gestures, and other cues to interpret speech. There's different factors that impact lip reading, including how visible the sounds are, the rate of speech, and the use of visemes. So for example, the mouth shape of an mm sound is the same as the mouth shape of a b sound. So those might be challenging um, when engaging in speech reading tasks. And so therapy is really set to help individuals learn how to speech read using contextual cues and overall gestural communication. Um, Finally, that brings me briefly to facilitative communication strategies. And so facilitative communication strategies are really set to promote ease of listening. So this involves to, um, how, allowing the patient to learn how to provide instructions to another speaker to, uh, to maximize opportunities for hearing and structuring the environment to promote ease of listening. So for example, um, an individual might tell a speaker, well, could you please face me so that I can see your face? Or when you speak very quickly, I have a tough time speech reading you. Communication strategies related to hearing um, can be applied to friends and family, as well as the individual with, uh, who is hard of hearing or has the hearing concern. So family and friends, um, when engaging in communication interactions with individuals who are hard of hearing, don't chew gum, don't wear dark glasses, don't cover your mouth with your hand, and don't speak too quickly. And I'm aware that I'm speaking fairly quickly right now. Um, but do use exaggerated facial expressions, maybe uh, look at or face the individual when talking, and consider having a nice bright lighting in the communication environment. Finally, finding opportunities where you can limit background noise is specifically and um, helpful as well. For individuals, try to sit facing your communication partner with your back to a television monitor to reduce distractions, watch facial expressions, try and stay up to date on current events to provide context to the conversational setting, consider having nice bright lighting, um, and again, try and limit background noise. So for example, go out for dinner at a non-peak time to promote uh, ease of listening. And there's a couple of other strategies listed as well. In terms of speaking, if conversational partners have difficulty understanding, attempt to say a sentence a different way. Um, use a gentle rate of speech. And again, attend to background noise because that may facilitate um, and protect your voice. If there are episodes of disfluency or fluency is a concern, consider an intensive fluency treatment option. There are uh, two week, for example, intensive stuttering camps that can help promote fluency. And another option is augmentative alternative communication devices, such as low tech uh, communication boards or books with, a, with icons on them to help um, allow the individual to point to icons to indicate what they want to say. That may be a helpful option. There's also devices such as an iPad. You can have a software program such as Proloquota Go installed, and that has a tap to text speech option as well. So the last thing I wanted to mention was just to watch for swallowing concerns because of the, the tendency for swallowing concerns to be present in individuals with NF2. If individuals have pain when swallowing or feeling that something is stuck in their throat, um, exhibits trouble starting a swallow, has heartburn or coughing while eating, these are things that may present as risk factors for swallowing concerns. So the individuals recommended to speak with their primary care physician and then follow up for a swallowing evaluation with a speech language pathologist as needed. So in summary, communication concerns are common among individuals with NF2, swallowing concerns are also frequently occurring, and uh, speech language hearing and communication evaluation and intervention can be provided by speech language pathologists and audiologists. And there's a number of communication strategies that can be used to facilitate communication outcomes. Thank you for your time. 
Perfect. This, um, thank you so much for this uh, very insightful uh, talk and for keeping us um, on time. Um, there is um, there. There's a question from the chat um, uh, asking um, from a patient um, stating that uh, audiology testing for their child has been planned, but communications options are not discussed by their team. When should the family think about um, those options concerning communication, for example, such as learning sign language? Absolutely. So when we're thinking about bilingual education, if bilingual bilingualism is something that the family would like to embrace, really earlier the better when learning a second language. And so if um, learning sign language is something that that family would like to engage in, accessing that uh, training as early as possible would be a benefit, really before you need it. Um, and then, of course, because sign language involves the whole family and communication partners, um, getting everybody on board to learn that sign language is key. Perfect. Very good. And um, another question would be, so in order to learn a sign language or the, the lip reading, you know, would any speech pathologist offer these services or would families go to a specialized speech pathologist? That's a great question. So um, all speech language pathologists who have graduated from an accredited master's degree program will have knowledge of the hearing mechanism and the relationship between hearing and speech. However, if where you live, if it's possible to seek out a speech language pathologist that has specific expertise in oral rehabilitation, that would be to a benefit as that individual has probably individuals on their caseload. And um, you know, it, it is something that you can specialize in in speech language pathology. So I would start with that. And then mm -hmm. in the absence of a specialist being in your region, then, then seek services from a, a general speech language pathology care provider. Um, I should note that there are different options. So private practices, hospital-based speech services. There's also speech services available through the schools and university treatment centers. So there's four different types of locations where these services can be accessed. Super. That is um, very helpful. Um, perhaps uh, one, one last question. Are there any online resources um, for patients where they can look up these things? or get more information on any of those services? Absolutely. So the American Speech Language Hearing Association is a great source of support for speech language hearing services. And that website I'll put in the chat is www.assha.org. Super. Very good. Thank you so much for all your efforts and for this uh, excellent uh, talk. We are moving on to the last talk of our session, which um, will be presented by Dr. Stacy Martin. She is a psychologist and the clinical and training director at the pediatric oncology branch at uh, NCI NIH. Uh, Dr. Martin specializes in using acceptance and mindfulness-based interventions for coping with physical and psychological effects of illness, uh, such as pain. She has been very instrumental in um, developing coping strategies um, for patients um, with NF and will be sharing her um, experience with us today. Uh, Dr. Martin, you are still on mute. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Now I lost my slides. Um, I wonder if the. I think tech, yeah, tech will, will do it. We just give them a second. Could you please? Yep, I think it's coming up. Great. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, so I'm Stacy Martin. I'm a psychologist from the National Institutes of Health. And um, I'm going to talk about complementary techniques for coping with pain in the neurofibromatoses. Um, so I'll talk about several different approaches to pain management, including physical activity, cognitive behavioral therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. 
And then I'm going to share some resources uh, where people can learn more about any of these options. Um, so I'm going to start talking about physical activity and, and you know, to give some context, the reason that some of these techniques um, can be helpful is because a lot of people with NF take pain medication, but um, it doesn't always work that well, or they don't want to take pain medication because of the side effects. So something like physical activity um, can be really helpful, particularly low impact physical activity for people with physical limitations um, or a lot of pain that cannot um, easily do more strenuous activities. So I'll mention things like yoga, tai chi, and walking. Um, so yoga is a technique that involves breath control um, coupled with body postures and movements. And it focuses a lot on improving core strength and balance. There have been a lot of studies showing that it does uh, help with pain, um, such as things like headache pain and back pain. Uh, and there's all different levels of yoga. You can start out really light um, with very, um, you know, gentle poses and movements and work your way up if that's feasible. In terms of kids and adolescents, um, there are not a lot of studies out there looking at the effects of yoga, but a good one that um, that I I like a lot was one that had children 8 to 18 years who had chronic abdominal pain do 10 sessions of yoga. And after these 10 lessons, the children reported significantly decreased pain. And not only that, but their parents reported that the kids were enjoying a better quality of life after uh, 10 sessions of yoga. So other positive outcomes that have been reported in additional studies include things like improved physical functioning, less disability, um, better sleep quality, lower anxiety, and fewer school absences. So Tai Chi is a series of gentle exercises and stretches in a flowing motion. So you're kind of constantly in motion. And in fact, it's also, it's earned the nickname meditation in motion. Um, because it can be very, um, very uh, um, in line with things like mindfulness and present moment awareness and meditation. Um, there are a few studies showing that it's effective for arthritis related pain and chronic back pain, but there aren't as many studies on Tai Chi as there are with things like yoga and other types of physical activity for pain relief. And I want to mention just walking. Um, it seems so obvious, but it's it's a really great way to engage in physical activity. It's free. It's available to everyone. You can walk with a pet or in groups or alone. And um, research has shown that walking improves pain and disability and quality of life. Um, so it's a really nice option um, for a way to address pain in people that um, So moving into some of the psychological therapies, um, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT has the goal of examining and changing maladaptive thought patterns and behaviors. It includes a wide variety of techniques such as relaxation and biofeedback, which I'll mention in a little bit more detail, problem solving and identifying and changing irrational thoughts. Um, there is evidence for adults with pain that it can be helpful. Um, one kind of overview study found that it reduced pain in 43% of the individual research studies that were um, examined. Um, another study found that it may not be any better than physical therapy for people with chronic back pain. So it's an option, but it's not a cure-all for sure. In children, the research has shown that a little more than half of people with this treatment improve in terms of their pain. Um, but a lot of studies show that there are not necessarily improvements in things like pain related disability and emotional functioning. So again, it, it helps some of the people some of the time, kind of the bottom line with CBT. Um, a couple of specific um, uh, components of CBT that are widely used are things like relaxation and guided imagery. So for example, with guided imagery, 
It involves intentionally thinking of a peaceful place and noticing the sensory details to bring about feelings of relaxation. So if you are working with a CBT therapist, they might have you start out by sitting or lying in a quiet area in a comfortable position, closing your eyes, taking some slow, gentle breaths, and then imagining a peaceful scene. And it's, you know, wherever that is for you, somewhere that makes you feel really relaxed, um, somewhere up in the mountains, near a stream, um, in a, on a tropical island on the beach, or just maybe a comfortable room or spot in your own home. And then they would take you through imagining the details of what you see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. So if you imagine yourself on the beach, maybe you notice in your imagination, you see the, um, the sand and the trees around you. You can hear the waves crashing into the shore, feel a breeze on your skin. Maybe you can um, taste a cool drink and smell um, the suntan lotion or something like that. You would continue that for several minutes and then open your eyes and just kind of assess how relaxed you feel. Um, biofeedback is another method under the CBT umbrella that involves providing feedback to people about their biological and physiological processes. So how does it work? Um, you would have electrodes attached to your skin that send signals to a monitor. So you would look at the monitor and, and the monitor would show um, feedback on things like your heart rate, your breathing, your blood pressure, and so forth. And when you see that in real time, you can then try to relax and change those stress responses. So by taking slow, deep breaths, you might notice that your heart rate is slowing down on the monitor. And eventually the goal is that you would learn to then um, engage those functions and influence those functions without the equipment. Um, and that has been found to be helpful um, in terms of pain relief. Now I'll talk about now acceptance and commitment therapy, which is said as ACT rather than ACT. So it's kind of the word ACT. Um, and ACT has been, this is the model that I practice with um, the people that I see with NF. It's effective with various types of chronic pain, um, as you can see there. And in addition to pain, it also improves things like just depression, anxiety, and quality of life. Um, numerous organizations have supported ACT as being effective with chronic pain in adolescents and adults. So it has a lot of um, research backing it up. What's a little bit different about ACT from the other types of um, psychological um, and complementary techniques that you might hear about is that the goal of ACT is actually not to eliminate or reduce the person's pain, but to optimize the person's quality of life while living with the pain. So you have this pain, you've tried to get rid of it, and it hasn't you know, left, it's still present. So how do we make your life the best life you can live even while you have this pain? Some of the key concepts include mindfulness, willingness, and then values and committed action. Um, mindfulness is non-judgmental, moment-to-moment awareness. You can practice mindfulness through a lot of different ways, things like mindful breathing, just noticing the breath as you inhale and exhale. Um, body scans where you move through each part of the body, for example, starting with your feet, moving up to the top of your head. And while you're focusing on each part of the body, you simply notice the sensations that are there. You learn to kind of notice the sensations without impulsively responding to them or tensing up in response to them. And then you can also practice mindfulness just in daily activities, such as mindful eating, mindful walking. You can listen to music mindfully, you can do chores mindfully. You can engage with family members and friends more mindfully. The next component that I'll mention is willingness, which is um, finding a different way of relating to the pain or disease, uh, dropping the struggle against it. So often people spend a lot of energy trying to control their pain or, um, or get rid of their pain. And willingness is basically um, accepting that the pain is present in this moment. Um, and a good illustration of that is you can't get rid of your fears, but you can learn to live with them. So you can learn to live with pain. It just takes a, a different mindset and that's what ACT um, helps with. 
So the big question with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for chronic pain, willingness is related to people actually reporting less pain. So ironically, when you're willing to have pain, you often don't have as much pain. Um, there's lower pain related impairment and lower pain related anxiety when people score high on willingness or acceptance of their pain. And even with acute pain, um, people who are taught to respond to pain with acceptance and willingness uh, tolerate pain more than a, a group of people who are taught to just distract themselves from the pain. So the question that an ACT therapist would ask and work with you on is what discomfort are you willing to have in order to live a fulfilling life? And then values. Um, in ACT, we talk about values in terms of the people and things or activities that are most important to you. And also how you wanna show up in life. You know, what, how, what kind of person do you wanna be even while you have pain? So, an illustration of this is that on both sides of the screen, you see um, a representation of someone's life where they both have the same amount of pain, but the person whose pain is surrounded by small circles um, is in a different situation because those small outer circles represent the person's values. On the other hand, um, on the right hand side of the screen, the values are you know things like friends, family, et cetera. Um, and those things take up a lot of the person's focus and a lot of their life. They spend a lot of time connecting with um, their values. And so, you know, as a visual illustration, you can ask the person, you know, I can't get rid of your pain, but these are your two options, right? Do you want to have pain surrounded by the small circles or surrounded by the big circles? And we can gradually kind of grow those, those circles, those values in the person's life through ACT therapy. Um, I wanted to go through some resources with people. If you're interested in connecting with an actual therapist or practitioner, there are uh, websites here where you can do that. Um, if you're interested in working with someone for ACT, CBT, or biofeedback. There's a lot of free resources. Um, some of the ones that I've listed there are specific to ACT and mindfulness. Um, those are the ones I'm most familiar with since that's the work that I do. Um, and there are also some of my favorite books um, for people with pain, Full Catastrophe Living um, by John Kabat-Zinn, who's the father of the modern mindful movement, um, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, um, which is an act book, uh, kind of a workbook, and then a mindfulness-based stress reduction workbook. So all of these help people walk through different activities um, and exercises focused on um, pain. There's also, of course, apps for, apps for each of these things, um, for mindfulness meditation, um, ACT and relaxation, um, as shown here, um, including apps for, for biofeedback. Um, and that is, that is all I have. Perfect. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for this um, excellent and very informative talk. Uh, we're still waiting for um, some questions to come in um, through the chat. Um, but uh, let me start by asking, um, how, how early can like, children be um, included in these kind of pain coping strategies? Right. Um, well, of course, children can be involved in things like yoga and walking and these other types of physical activity. In terms of mindfulness, there are special mm -hmm. mindful activities that are geared towards children. So teaching them to kind of do belly breathing. Um, there's a book called Sitting Still Like a Frog, which teaches them, you know, younger children to kind of um, practice uh, different types of mindful breathing and mindful exercises and awareness exercises at their developmental level. So I would say elementary school age is, is a good place to start. Very good, excellent. And um, let me see if they have any questions that have come in. I don't see 
I don't see any. Are they, um, you showed you showed those resources um, uh, on online, so how patients can access those um, ACT, um, uh, you know, those web pages. Does this include also as uh, sessions that patients could um, sign up for to specifically um, uh, get help on that if something locally is not available? We often have that problem that locally there is no therapist available. Right. So some of the websites I mentioned have a, a button where you can kind of click on to find a therapist in either in your local area or, you know, given the fact that so many people are working remotely these days, um, possibly connecting with someone who, you know, is beyond your local area. Um, so, yeah, there, there are definitely options if you go to those websites to, to find out more on that. Super. Excellent, excellent. And um, we are like uh, two minutes um, over time and um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the forum at the moment. So um, I think everybody is perhaps um, craving for a noon break. It has been a very long session and I want to thank uh, all the speakers for excellent talks, for excellent information for our patients. And um, I hope to see you in um, one of the other sessions this afternoon or next year, hopefully in person during the NF meeting. Again, uh, thank you so much. And um, I think um, everybody should have a nice uh, lunch break. And I'm handing over to um, Tracy Ann. To Tracy Ann, <laughs> exactly. I was just like, uh, I was seeing the computer moving. I was not quite sure what's happening. Thank you, Tracy Ann. It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for these incredible talks and uh, resource and information. And Verena did such a great job moderating. Like Verena mentioned, we're going to break now for a lunch or whatever. Uh, mindfulness, you know, <laughs> and uh, we resume at 145 for the clinical research and patient engagement session. I just posted the link in the chat, but it's the same meeting link for the general session this morning as well. And in case you forget, you could always go to ctf.org slash NF forum and click on the session for this afternoon. Okay, I also posted a meeting ID as well in here. All right, well, thank you for your time and we'll see you this afternoon. Have thank a lovely weekend, bye-bye. Thank you everybody. Bye.